And it has to do with the story in Matthew 16 when the Pharisees and the Sadducees finally came together to go after the Son of God. You know, folk, I don't understand why it is today that in Seventh-day Adventism, we don't get, and I'm just going to mention a person's name, uh, Walter Veith. I, I don't get it. I don't get why Walter does not understand the fact that Christ and his disciples had an, a self-supporting ministry in the first century. And that it was the denomination, the Adventist denomination in the first century that slew the Son of God. I, I, don't, I don't understand. It's like... I was watching a video this week of Walters in which he was saying that uh, Christ and the disciples were the true church in the first century. And it's like he completely negated the denomination in the first century. Well, it's clear from the Gospels, from Desire of Ages, that in the first century, the denomination was what caused Christ and the self-supporting workers so much hell. It was the denomination in the first century that pushed Pilate to kill the Son of God. So I, I just don't understand why that's not plain and clear. The backdrop for our lesson today, Matthew chapter 16, it says the Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. In the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? And then in verse 6, Jesus warned his disciples, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, and of the Sadducees. And then in verse 12 of Matthew 16, it says the disciples finally understood that Jesus was warning the disciples against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, folk... If we think we're listening to an ancient story, we have developed in Seventh-day Adventism the same groups that were in existence in Christ's day. There were the fanatical, extreme, hard-hearted Pharisees on the one, in the one ditch, and then in the other ditch, there were the liberal Sadducees who were throwing out fundamental Adventist teachings. So we're going to look at those two groups this morning and how ultimately, number one, what they believed and what modern Pharisees and Sadducees believe but also how they ultimately went after the Son of God. You know, people today, they look and they say, oh, well, you know, the conference is uh, fighting against self-supporting ministries. Uh, <laughs> that's really not true, friends, because there are wing nuts in both groups. You have in the denomination, you have extremes, and in self-supporting ministry, you have extremes. 
There are in Adventism today two groups that seem to be at odds with each other, but will one day unite together. There's also a third group in Seventh-day Adventism today, as there was in Jesus' day, that will carry the torch of truth onto victory. The issue is not, you know, folk, I, I hear this in Adventism all the time. It's, you know, it's the conference versus the self-supporting work. No, it's not. The issue is over truth. What is truth? Whether you're in the conference or in self-supporting work, the issue is the same issue that Pilate dealt with that Friday morning in Jerusalem when Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? And so where we stand on truth that's the issue, friends. Because we have both ditches in Adventism today. The issue isn't between two groups. It's over truth versus error. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's see how it works. Matthew chapter 5, verses 19 to 22. Jesus said, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus warned against religious people in his day that were fanatical, that were extreme, that were ugly people. And after he warns about these people, he says, you've heard it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Folk, the Pharisees were angry people. The Pharisees wanted to stuff their ideas down people's throats. That's who the Pharisees were. Desire of Ages, page 309, talks about this group of people in Adventism. The rabbis counted their righteousness a passport to heaven. Jesus declared it to be inefficient, insufficient, and unworthy. External ceremonies and a theoretical knowledge of truth constituted pharisaical righteousness. If our religion, friend, is only about outward ceremonies and a knowledge of theories. That's, we're a Pharisee. We're a plain, full-blown Pharisee. The only righteousness that matters is the righteousness that controls within. The righteousness that controls the mind and heart and empowers us to do right. That's the only righteousness that matters. A righteousness that only goes to outward acts. That's Phariseeism. The rabbis claim to be holy through their own efforts in keeping the law. <laughs> That's so ridiculous. How can a sinful, wretched, miserable person through their own efforts, obey a perfect law. That's impossible. We can't do that. Because the law is holy, 
As Romans 7 tells us in verse 12, the law of the Lord is perfect, David said in Psalm 19. So how can a sinful person keep a perfect law? The Pharisees, the rabbis said they could do it through their own efforts. Jesus said that's ridiculous, and it is, because it is only through faith in Jesus Christ that we can obey God's law. Their works had divorced righteousness from religion. While they were punctilious in ritual observances, their lives were immoral and debased. The greatest deception of the human mind in Christ's day was that a mere assent to the truth constitutes righteousness. That's not righteousness. That's a deception, as Ellen White said. In all human experience, a theory of the truth has been proved to be insufficient for the saving of the soul. It doesn't bring forth the fruits of righteousness. A jealous regard for what is termed theological truth often accompanies a hatred of genuine truth as made manifest in the life. Folk, again, pharisaical righteousness only applies God's law to outward acts of behavior. But Jesus Christ is at arm's length with a Pharisee. They want nothing to do with Jesus. But true righteousness can only be found in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only way, friends. It's the only way. They thought themselves the greatest religionists of the world. But their so-called orthodoxy led them to crucify the Lord of glory. If, if the truth that we profess does not make us sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, and heavenly minded, that truth is a curse to us. And through our influence, it is a curse to the world. Desire of Ages, page 309. So again, friends, if our religion is all about a theory and accepting a head knowledge, but it doesn't lead us to submit to Jesus, it's a waste. If our religion, friend, and the truth we profess doesn't work sincerity, kindness, patience, forbearance, heavenly mindedness, it's a curse. It's a curse, friend. We've all met them. People who judge every single thing you do. Judge everything you do. Condemn you for having tomatoes and fruit salad during your lunch. Whose orthodoxy makes you want to vomit. I remember one time somebody brought some, a dessert, a healthy dessert for our fellowship lunch here at Truth Triumphant. And some folks were visiting us and they said, we, we don't eat any of that stuff. That's a dessert. We don't eat desserts. And folk, they condemned us. They refused to stay during the lunch because their ideas of truth condemned us. I've had people look down their, their glasses at me because I have tomatoes and I have a fruit salad at my lunch. I've had Adventists come through this place and they say, you know, you've got to make sure everybody has two meals a day. Otherwise, you're not preaching present truth. 
folk, you know, we go to these gross extremes, and that's Pharisaical Adventism. That's what it is. It's Pharisaical Adventism. They'll call down heaven on you for a trifle and then let you know how pious they are. Shame on us, friend, as a people. Shame on us for allowing extremes and fanaticisms to excuse our sinful behavior because we refuse to surrender to Jesus Christ. These are the Adventists. How many of these we have in self-supporting ministries today? It's pathetic. They're all in self-supporting ministries. They go to extremes in false doctrine. They try to force it down your throat and they put you in hell if you don't agree with them. The 2520 people, the feast day people, the no Holy Spirit people, the churches Babylon people, the flat earth people. We could go on and on and on. But we have extremes in Seventh-day Adventism. We have religious orthodoxy. And folk, anything we believe, anything that we teach, if it doesn't make us sincere, kind, patient, forbearing, and heavenly minded, what did Ellen White say? It's a curse. It's a curse to us and to the world. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, what, what does it mean? Feast days. The question was, what does that mean, the feast days? In the ancient Hebrew sanctuary, uh, in the ancient Hebrew religious calendar, they had certain days. They had Passover. They had Pentecost. They had the Feast of Trumpets. Do you still have babies? No. No, we don't. And the reason we don't is because, as the Apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, they were all pointing forward to something Jesus would do. Christ was the Passover. Pentecost pointed forward to Christ as our high priest. Trumpets pointed forward to the great Advent awakening in the 1830s. Atonement pointed forward to Christ's final work in the most holy place. Tabernacles pointed forward to Jesus coming. So when Christ came, the instructive nature of the feast days was still there. However, we don't keep them. Because in keeping them, we are rejecting the Son of God. So we have these extremes in Adventism. They claim orthodoxy, but they're cruel, they're rude, and you don't want to be around them very long. Now, how about on the other side, the other ditch in Adventism today that Christ faced in his day? He faced the fanatical extreme Pharisee that was rejecting Christ in the life. There was also the other extreme of the Sadducee. Cody, go ahead. Before you get into that, if I could just ask a question that I know a lot of people who are viewing would be asking. Please. Why does it always seem like you are bashing these other doctrines, these other preachers? 
Is there a biblical basis for that? Why is this so heavy on your heart in particular, where it's not seen as much in some other ministers? Cody, I will answer that with a passage in Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, excuse me, Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 2. Son of man, speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, took not warning, his blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet and the people be not warned. That's Ezekiel chapter 33. We're in verse 6. If the people and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them. He is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Cody, God has set us as watchmen. And if we see something that is destroying people's lives and we say nothing, then we're, we're held accountable for that. We're held accountable. And so you see in Adventism today, you see these extremes on the left and you see extremes on the right. And thousands of Seventh-day Adventists today are embracing false teachings. They're embracing feast days. They're embracing uh, the church's Babylon. They're embracing um, no Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit as a presence. Uh, they're embracing the original writings. They're embracing the flat earth. Cody, those teachings are destroying people. And it is the job of a watchman on the walls of Zion to warn people against these extremes in doctrine. On the other ditch, we have, well, I was going to bring this up, but I'll, I'll just tell you right here and now. We have people today, uh, Walter Weiss, uh, Dr. O at State Line Church. Uh, we have Stephen Bohr. We have Mark Finley. We have 3ABN. We have Doug Batchelor, who are claiming to be watchmen on the walls of Zion claiming to be warning Adventist people. And while they are saying that, ecumenism is destroying the very fabric of this church. It's destroying it. And none of them will say anything. All of them will say, you just got to keep putting your money in the church. You've got to keep going to the church and listening to false teaching. Cody, that defies reason, defies logic, defies scripture and the spirit of prophecy. So if somebody is 
thinking that they've got to support apostasy? Well, Cody, I'm going to warn them. And I'm going to tell them, you are destroying your soul. And if you don't turn around, you continue to support this apostasy, you will end up supporting, you're supporting the rise of the image of the beast in Seventh-day Adventism. Now, Cody, I believe that that's worth bashing about. That's worth warning people about because it's destroying millions of God's professed people today. The Sadducees were on the other extreme. Let's notice what Desire of Ages says. The Sadducees denied the existence of angels, the resurrection of the dead, the doctrine of a future life, with its rewards and punishments. On all these points, they differed with the Pharisees. Between the two parties, the resurrection was especially a subject of controversy. So what the Sadducees did, just by looking at the very first part of this statement in Desire of Ages, page 603. They denied the existence of angels. They denied the resurrection. They denied that there was even a future life. So the hope, <laughs> the hope of ancient Adventists that there was something beyond the grave, that there was a time in the future when people would either get a reward or a punishment as to how they live their life here on earth, the Sadducees said, that doesn't even exist. There's no such thing. So folk, fundamental ancient Adventist teaching was denied by the Sadducees. <laughs> Have mercy. It says many of them were wealthy. They had the influence which wealth imparts. In their ranks were included most of the priests. And from among them the high priest was chosen. Usually. This was however with the express stipulation. That their skeptical opinion should not be made prominent. Okay. So this is Desire of Ages 603. The Sadducees rejected the teaching of Jesus. He was animated by a spirit which they would not acknowledge as manifesting itself thus. And his teaching in regard to God and the future life contradicted their theories. Now do we have, do we have in Seventh-day Adventism today, do we have a class of people that are denying fundamental Adventist teachings. Well, you say, well, you know, Desmond Ford was just throwing the, you know, the, the whole barrel out. Well, yeah, Desmond Ford was a gross extreme. But we have people today in Seventh-day Adventism claiming, claiming to be present truth speakers. And they are denying some, just the simplest of things in the word of God. Liberal Adventism. The Sadducees were the liberal Adventists of today that throw out fundamental Adventist teaching when it doesn't suit their material interests. In order to protect their greedy interests, they tell Adventists to stay in the apostasy by squirting glue on the pew and to stay listening to false teaching. That defies logic, Walter. That defies logic. 
and you, a profound doctor and professor, know that. When are you going to come clean, Walter? When are you going to stop lying to the Adventist people and tell them the truth? This idea of listening to ministers who refuse to tell the truth, who are uniting in the ecumenical movement, who are paving the way for sun worship among Seventh-day Adventists, and we're supposed to support that? Listening to an imbibing false teaching, salvation in sin. Why, we're just Laodicea, right, Walter? They tell Adventists that the only storehouse is the organized church and that it's a sin to support self supporting work. That's garbage, Walter. That's garbage, Stephen Bohr. That's garbage, Dr. O. How? Who's that? I'm not familiar with that. You know, you know his king? Who is it? Vitali Oleni. I don't know him. Yeah, I don't know him. Uh -uh. Is he saying the same thing these guys are? If he is, I'd put his name up here too. How is it? Now, now, I want you to help me with this, folk. How is it we have these intellects in Seventh-day Adventism today? We have the Walter Veith, Stephen Bohr, and Dr. O. Most, at least two of the three, have doctor in front of their names. And, and we, as I did with the Total Onslaught series, appreciated, appreciated the scholarly research that Dr. Weiss put into his Total Onslaught series. How is it, how is it that Dr. Veith, Stephen Bohr, another man who comes across as a great researcher, as a man who studies, and Dr. O, he's got that doc in front of his name too, doesn't he? How is it that these gentlemen would tell people in Seventh-day Adventism just keep putting your money in the till. Keep supporting the apostasy. How is it that they would dare to do that? When Ellen White and the Bible are very clear that that is a lie. So why, Walter, why Stephen Bohr, Dr. O, and others... Why are you lying to Seventh-day Adventists and telling them to keep supporting the apostasy? Why? When you know better. Notice this statement. Ellen White's letter, 1905 to Elder G.F. Watson. Published in the Spalding McGann Unpublished Testimonies 215 and 216. She said, For years there have now and then been persons who have lost confidence in the appropriation of the tithe, who have placed the tithe in my hands. What did the people just do? They bypassed the storehouse. They said, We're not going to support garbage anymore. We're going to support people who are being bypassed by the denomination. So what did the people do? They bypassed the denomination. They put the money directly in Ellen White's hands and said, use this 
to support ministers who are doing the work. They said that if I did not take it, they would themselves appropriate it to the families of the most needy minister they could find. I have taken the money. Oh, shame on Ellen White. She took money that should have gone into the storehouse. Why did she do that? She did that because she knew that there were at least two or more storehouses in her day. Just as there was in the times of the apostles. Just as there is today. I have taken the money, given a receipt for it, and told them how it was appropriated. I write this to you so that you shall keep cool and not become stirred up and give publicity to this matter, lest many more shall follow this example. What was going on, friends? Ellen White was getting tithes and offerings. She was then sending them to ministers in the South who were not receiving funding from the denomination. She was bypassing Battle Creek. She was bypassing Tacoma Park, sending it directly to those men. Was Ellen White outside of Scripture? Was Ellen White not following the Holy Spirit? According to Walter? Come on, Walter, quit lying to people. Dr. O, Stephen Bohr, lying and saying it's all got to go through the conference. That's the only storehouse. Well, it wasn't that way, gentlemen, in the first century, nor in Ellen White's day, nor is that the case today. Testimonies to ministers. Now, this one's uh, unpublished testimony, 176, 177. God grant that the voices which have been so quickly raised to say that all the money invested in the work must go through the appointed channel, the general conference at Battle Creek, shall not be heard. Walter, I thought you were intelligent. I thought you did your research. Why are you telling people to put it only into denominational coffers? When Ellen White says, that voice should not be heard. I thought you were, I thought you studied, Walter. Stephen Vohr, Dr. O. I thought you gentlemen were educated. Why are you lying to Adventists? You know these quotes as well as I do. You probably know them better than I do. The people to whom God has given his means are amenable to him alone. Is that what we hear today? Modern day Sadducees say, you got to put your money in the storehouse. It's the only place it's got to go. That's not what Ellen White said. And you men know better. So why do you continue to lie to Seventh-day Adventists? They're privileged to give direct aid and assistance to missions. It's because of the misappropriation of means by church leaders that the southern field has no better showing than it has today. Testimonies to Ministers 321, the arrangement that all monies must go through Silver Springs and under the control of the few men in that place 
is a wrong way of managing. Walter, did you hear that? Stephen Bohr, Dr. O, did you hear what she said? You know the quote. So stop lying to Adventist people. Ellen White letter, January 22, 1905. I myself have appropriated my tithe to the most needy cases brought to my notice. She did what? She's in rebellion against God. She bypassed the denomination. Oh, <laughs> I've been instructed to do this. Who instructed Ellen White to do that, friends? Did the devil instruct her? According to these rock stars in Adventism, must not have been the Spirit of God that instructed Ellen White because she's doing exactly the opposite of what these men are telling Adventists to do. So Ellen White bypassed the denomination. And she says, the money is not withheld from the Lord's treasury. Really? It's not a matter that should be commented on. It will necessitate my making known these matters, which I do not desire to do because it's not best. If any person shall say to me, Sister White, will you appropriate my tithe where you know it's most needed? I shall say, yes, I will, and I have done so. And I commend those sisters. Ellen White commended people who bypassed the denomination, Walter. Did you hear that? Why do these men continue to lie to Seventh-day Adventists. Why are you doing that? Cody, go ahead. What about the counter-argument that would be made, which is Mrs. White was a prophet, so that's different. That's a different situation. So she can accept tithe because she was a prophet of God. That's not the case today. What would you say to that? My response, Cody, would be she commended the people in her day that were bypassing the denomination and were appropriating their monies elsewhere. She commended them for that. She said, we are amenable to God alone. So why are the modern day Sadduceical doctors in Adventism, why are they lying to Seventh-day Adventists? As I said, they know, they know things better than I do. How about Madison? How about all the self-supporting ministries that were spawned from Madison? How about the fact that Ellen White told Sutherland and McGann go directly to Adventist people and ask for support. What about that, Walter? Come on! You're denying the history of Madison and the support of that self-supporting ministry that Ellen White told Sutherland and McGann to do. You will say anything to ensure your paycheck. What about it, Dr. Thomas, up there in Ohio? You lie and tell people to put their money in the conference? How can you? To support this? This is what you support? You condemn it, Walter. 
You condemn it, Dr. O. You condemn it, Pastor Thomas. You condemn this. Not by name, of course. You wouldn't dare say anything ill against the Adventist Pope. You condemn this with your mouth. And then you turn right around, on one side you condemn it, and on the other side of your mouth you say, support it with your money. Please explain the logic. Please explain the logic in that argument. Support that? Support the ecumenical movement? Support the setting up of Sunday in Seventh-day Adventism? Shame on you. You support that too, don't you? Gwinnun Diop travels the planet to strengthen Adventist ecumenism. Walter, you're going to tell Adventists to support that right there? Stephen Bohr, Dr. O, You want me to support that? Take a gun and shoot me. I will never support that. Never. Stephen Barr, you support that? Walter Veith, you support... Oh, no, we condemn it. No, but you tell people to give their money to support that. Explain the logic to me. You say it's wrong, but then you pay money and tell others to pay to support it. Shame on you. Jesus said, take heed of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. You better watch out, friend. Because the monies that you put into the Adventist till are being used to support that. Right there. And to support this. That's where your monies are going, friend. And God will judge us. God will judge you, friend. Because you know better. And you're putting your money towards the setting up of Sunday worship in Seventh-day Adventism. Jesus said, you better watch out for this hypocr these hypocritical doctrines. The extremes of Phariseeism and the hypocrisy of the Sadducees. You support this? You like the great hope, Walter? You talk about the great controversy, Dr. O., but you're telling people to support this. I don't see logic in that. And then you ask me, you say, well, why are you bashing these people? Because they're not watchmen. They're hypocrites. That's why. Every time you put money in the conference till, you're supporting ecumenism and the road to Sunday. Every time you put in money, you're supporting the destruction of the great controversy and supporting the rise of the one world church. And is God going to hold you accountable? Is there any accountability? Oh no, I just, I just close my eyes. And I turn my back and I just put the money in the till. And after that, whatever they do with it, that's their business. Really? We are amenable to God alone. And if you know better and you keep supporting it, you're putting yourself on the side of ecumenism in Sunday. Is that where you want to stand, friends? Walter's kicking you that way. Stephen Bohr's telling you it's, that's the way to go. Dr. O wants you to do it too.
The Sadducees also believed that the most important thing was not truth. The most important thing to the Sadduceical mind was saving the church. We've got to save the church no matter what. Walter, are you trying to save the denomination by telling people to support it? You know it's not true. When Jesus raised Lazarus, they had a meeting in John eleven forty seven to 54. And they said, what are we going to do? People are going to start following this guy. And if they do, then our church will be destroyed. And the Romans will come in and destroy it and take away our place as a nation. So what did the Sadducees say? What did Caiaphas say? Caiaphas said, we've got to do whatever we need to do to save the church. And so in saving the church, that meant they had to kill the truth. Walter, you're killing the truth about the tithe. You're killing it, Walter, and you know it. Stephen Bohr, Dr. O, and the rest of you guys, you know it. You're killing the truth. Caiaphas urged that after this miracle, the followers of Jesus would rise in a revolt. What is the life of this Galilean worth in comparison with the life of the nation? If he stands in the way of Israel's well-being, is it not doing God a service to remove him? Better that one man perish than that the whole nation be destroyed. Caiaphas' argument, the Sadducees' argument, we've got to save the church. The church's future is on the line. We've got to protect it. We've got to protect our jobs. We've got to protect our salary. So we're going to kill the truth. We're going to kill it. Friends, Caiaphas's efforts to save the church in his day, they ended in 70 AD. Efforts to save Adventism today, first selected messages, 204 and 205 says that because of apostasy, storm and tempest will sweep away the structure. All efforts to save the denomination in sin, in ecumenism, it's going to be destroyed, friends. Just as it was in the first century, it will be today. And where will we stand then? after telling people for decades to support that.